This week on the RV Podcast. Why one of the nation's top Lemon Law attorneys says that RVers must be nuts to buy a new RV and an insidious legal provision that most people sign, that's the reason why. There is a lot of disappointment by RVers as the Albuquerque balloon fiesta has decided to reduce the number of RV camping spots this year to make way for more car parking. We have the dates for our spring summer RV lifestyle meetup, June 11th through the 14th. And we're going to announce the details and the ticket sales Thursday evening in a special live stream on our new RV lifestyle community. All this plus the RV News of the Week and your questions coming up on episode 485 of the RV Podcast. everybody. I'm Mike Wendland, and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer. You should have been wearing that last week, and I could have said, and my Valentine. I know. I thought of that when I got out the sweater. Yeah. Hey, uh, just a quick reminder that you can watch the video version from our RV Lifestyle YouTube channel. All you have to do is go to youtube.com slash RV Lifestyle. And if you prefer an audio-only podcast, you can hear us through your favorite podcast app, uh, or listen to us through the player on rvlifestyle.com. You know, I was just thinking, I'm always your Valentine. Oh, yeah. I like hearing that kind <laughs> of talk. Um, hey, a quick heads up. This is a big week for us because we are about to uh, open ticket sales for our spring and summer RV lifestyle gathering. Dates are coming up quick. June 11th to the 14th, and complete details are going to be announced in a special live stream on our RV Lifestyle community at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Thursday, February 22nd. If you're already a member uh, of the uh, RV Lifestyle community, you're going to see it in the main feed and under the events tab. But if you are not yet a member, what better time is there? Just go over to um, community. Dot rvlifestyle.com. That's community.rvlifestyle.com. We are really excited about this. And we think it's going to be one of our most fun-filled meetups yet. You want to give away, well, we don't want to give away the details, mm -mm. but why don't we share the theme? It's a groove and gather. Groove and gather. How groovy. I <laughs> uh, wonder why we would call it that. Tune into the live stream Thursday and learn why we're calling it that. It is going to be a, uh, a great time. Uh, well, Bo is with us here in the uh, studio. I don't have all the cameras on, but he's uh, getting his pets right He now. needs some pets. He had a very stressful morning. He had a bath. Yep, he Poor did. guy. Oh, that is so heartbreaking to take him because he had this little plaintive little bark as, the, oh. as we all left. It was terrible. Uh, okay. Uh, we've been back in Michigan for the past 10 days, and you know what that means. It's time to hit the road again. <laughs> and we're off this week, headed to Florida and the Gulf Coast among other places, and we'll be doing a lot of live stream videos and on-location reports. Right now, uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and then when we come back, we've got the social media buzz. Stay with us. You know, there's only a handful of places where you can enjoy temperatures in the 70s during the harshest months of winter, and one of those is Arizona. Um, but most places that you try and get into in an RV, you'll find they're very expensive, they're crowded. Well, there are new RV ownership properties outside of Phoenix. The development is known as Saguaro Acres, and the prices start at $39,900. Uh, great owner financing available. Uh, these are two to five acre sites. And the best part is they all have access to beautiful uh, Alamo Lake and the Arizona Peace Trail, which is this great ATV trail that people from all over the world come to. This is ownership. You own this land, so you don't need any reservations to go stay. There's no time limits how long you can stay, no crowded parks. You share it, rent it, whatever you want because it's your land. So this new development in Arizona is worth you guys checking out if you're out west and you're thinking about some, some cool property. Just go to BigAZLand.com. All one word, BigAZLand.com. The one thing that can ruin a perfect RV trip is a bad mattress. And believe us, we know. Over the years, we've tried many and we have found them all wanting until now. Now, we sleep on the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. 
Quite simply, it's the best we've ever slept on. We chose a queen-size Aurora Lux medium firm mattress that arrived tightly rolled in a box. All we did was put it on the bed, unroll it, and wait for it to recover from the compression. Then we put on the sheets and the bed covers and found we slept so well that we ordered another one for our home. That's how comfortable it is. Our sleep is now so luxurious and deep that we can't imagine using a different mattress. Shipping is free. If you're disappointed with the current mattress in your RV, you owe it to yourselves to try the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Brooklyn Bedding sends out all of their RV mattresses from their own factory in Arizona. This means they're able to use premium materials at a reasonable price for you with no middleman bringing up the cost. Don't miss out on the best sleep of your life. Visit rvmattress.com slash RV lifestyle and hurry because once November's over, so are these incredible deals. Welcome back. And now it's time for the social media buzz with Wendy Boyer. And uh, Wendy always has reports on hot issues most talked about this past week on the social media and our RV lifestyle community. So RVers love to share information and help each other out. So let's hear it. Wendy Boyer. Hi, everybody. Over in our RV lifestyle community, we added some new spaces this past week so people with shared interests can more easily find each other and connect. Some of those categories include digital nomads, RVs for sale, crafters corner, and the RV cooking exchange. This last category, the RV cooking exchange, is where one conversation caught my eye. There was a question asked, what is your must-have RV kitchen gadget or appliance? Lots of people were chiming in on this. Uh, Lisa wrote that she's not sure how she ever lived without her Ninja air fryer. She has the version with the grill setting and she says she can make the perfect juicy chicken filet or filet mignon and it's just super easy cleanup. Despina, now she's a woman after my own heart, she says she can't live without her French press for her morning coffee when she's camping. And then Anne mentioned she needs her cocktail glass and she also needs some foil because they're going to be cooking over the campfire or on the outdoor grill. And then Jean said she needs her griddle for those morning pancakes. I can already imagine how those taste. Um, so fun conversation there. And also in our RV lifestyle community, under the electrical space, we had a great tip from John. John wrote that one way he found to reduce the load on his batteries when he's camping without shore power and just isn't really up to turning on the generator is to use a small, inexpensive 12-volt inverter for just his TV and his DVD player. That way he doesn't get into the battery and uh, he went into some detail about how this works and several people said it was a very helpful tip. Um, Randall was one that caught my eye just said thanks for sharing that. And then meanwhile over in our RV Lifestyle Facebook group there was a post that I have to share with you. It's actually two posts. The first one was from Shana and she said that she was terrified to drive their class A and she asked if anyone else was terrified as well. She said she and her husband have a six-month trip coming up. Her husband usually does all the driving, but he asked her if she could please help. Now, Shana's a firefighter, so there's times when she drives those really big fire trucks. Um, but she said there's just something about driving the RV that terrified her. Her RV is a Jayco Precept 36C which she said was almost 39 feet long, and then they tow a Jeep. And she said every time she gets on the road, she just panics. So she, her first post asked the group for help. And many people gave her some great tips, be it practice, you know, off the roads, um, go to an RV driving school. Um, another tip was just to kind of change your thinking that this was probably in her head since she can drive a fire truck. And so just change your thinking and try to get yourself in a different frame of mind. Well, Shana's second post came five, six days later, and it was two pictures of her behind the wheel of her big rig driving, and it simply said, I forced myself to do it today. Thanks for all the encouragement. And everybody loved this post. Lots of comments in there. Way to go. I knew you could do it. Good job. It was super encouraging. So good job, Shana, and thanks for sharing that with us. 
And that's it for me this week. I'm Wendy Boyer, and I'll see you over in the RV Lifestyle community or Facebook group. Right now, I want to talk about uh, being connected on the road, and there's no better place to go than Mobile Must Have. Mobile Must Have is the sponsor of this part of the podcast, and it is a service that is started by RVers for RVers, and it's dedicated to providing the most needed mobile lifestyle solutions. And this month, Mobile Must Have is offering 30 days of free data with the purchase of a new PepLink router. Now, Mobile Must Have has PepLink routers and internet solutions for every type of RVers, from weekend and holiday vacationers to full-time road warriors and remote workers. And PepLink is the gold standard for mobile internet, and Mobile Must Have has a modem and a data plan that will fit literally every RV budget out there. They offer their Fusion SIM which can provide coverage to every major U.S. carrier. Mobile Must Have also has RV cellular antennas and wiring and cable solutions for Starlink satellite internet. Just go to rvlifestyle.com slash mobile must have. That's rvlifestyle.com slash mobile must have and schedule a free call and free consultation to see the many different internet packages that are available and the one that is just right for you. That's rvlifestyle.com slash mobile must have. All right, time now for the RV interview of the week. And uh, we've got an interesting guest this week that you're going to want to listen to very closely. Very serious matter. Steve Leto is a Michigan attorney, and he is um, one of the better known lemon law and consumer protection lawyers in the country. He's been doing this for 32 years. And he's also a YouTuber. And his channel is called Letho's Law and recently was uh, making the rounds with our viewers for a very interesting segment that he did call, Here is Why You Must Be Insane to Buy an RV These Days. Now, why would you be insane? Well, he did a whole segment about, and he's going to talk about it with us here, about a federal court case out of Virginia that really blew the lid off um, something that... Uh, RVers really need to understand the implications of it. It involved a man who bought a Class C RV, and it turned out, by all accounts, to be a lemon. And uh, Steve breaks it down, the uh, potential dire consequences of signing several papers. Many RV dealers slip into the stack of paperwork when buying an RV. Now, if you've bought an RV, you know they give you just a, a gazillion pieces of paper, and yeah, quick sign this, and... It's, you know, it's not high pressure, but um, you're, you're working very fast. And Steve is going to talk about that. He joins us this week and uh, explains the reason that he has made such a statement about being crazy to buy a new RV. And it has to do with this very overt but little understood provision in the sales contracts that many RVers have in which buyers sign an agreement that, in effect, makes it impossible for them to sue if they get a lemon. So Steve joins us as our special guest in this week's RV podcast interview of the week. Well, Steve joins us right now. And Steve, first of all, let me just tell you, I'm a big fan of your channel. And I, uh, I've, I'm going to link to it everywhere. Uh, there's so many things, particularly involving uh, RVs and motorhomes uh, and all the complaints we keep seeing about how bad the manufacturers, they, people need to know uh, your expertise on this thing. So Thank you for, for being there for everybody. Oh, absolutely. You know, I've been practicing consumer law for 32 years in the state of Michigan, primarily lemon law, which is defective cars, but people call me for defective anything. And I discovered about 31 and a half years ago that the number of phone calls I get regarding RVs is disproportionate. But that's simply because there's so much unhappiness in that industry with respect to consumer experiences. Why do you think... RVs are so problematic in this way. Uh, it used to be automobiles too, but they've, uh, because of attorneys like you, they've cleaned up their act a little bit. But why RVs? Well, one thing is, it's not the lawyers, it's the laws. There's lemon laws in most states that say if a car is defective, brand new, the manufacturer's got to either fix it or buy it back. But there are not those kinds of lemon laws for RVs in most states. A couple states have got them, but for the vast majority of states, they don't. And so a lot of people assume that the experience you just had with a brand new car will be similar to the experience you have with a brand new RV. 
And an RV is larger, it's more complex. They're built by a vast you know, array of manufacturers. And so there are, you know, so many different things that go into it. But, you know, imagine building a house and driving it down the road, which is what a lot of RV sellers will tell you that you're doing. And so a car is built for that. But an RV, some of them not so much. And and the problems I've heard where people bought a brand new RV, were driving it home from the dealer, got caught in the rain and the windshield was leaking. Things like that, which would never happen with a car, seemingly. And, and so I think that people are shocked that those things can happen, but they're shocked even more when they realize that the remedies are, are so difficult to get when it comes to an RV versus an automobile. Now, there's been a, a lot of talk, particularly among RV owners who have bought RVs post-COVID. Uh, during that COVID boom, many of the factories uh, just uh, hired anybody they could get because they were trying to make RVs as fast as the demand, which was huge. And so a lot of those are now, uh, we're hearing all these stories about them breaking down. But the story that I think we need to tell our people about is the one that you have been getting so much attention in the last couple of weeks, and that's this Virginia case. Um, we will link to your full explanation of that, but there are some pretty amazing things in that case that you have uh, brought to our attention. And could you share some of that, the top of the stuff, what people need to know uh, about uh, buying a new RV based on that case? And then we'll touch on another one in California in a minute. Yeah, the consumer bought a brand new RV, I think close to a $100,000 unit. And almost immediately, within a couple of weeks, it developed all kinds of problems, including with its engine, its drivetrain, made it undrivable. And so he got annoyed at how long it was taking to fix in that they weren't apparently making any progress in fixing it. So he didn't have it, didn't have it. And finally, he just filed a lawsuit. And Camping World went into court and said, well, number one, you can't sue us because you signed a whole raft of disclosures in your purchase agreement, sales contract, all the documents you signed when you bought that thing, and you waived all your rights to be able to sue us. And second, Thor, the manufacturer said, and by the way, if you want to sue us, you got to do it in Indiana, <laughs> because that's in the warranty booklet that you got when you bought your RV. And most people don't go looking at the nuances of where they have to file lawsuits or what they're waiving, because let's face it, you go to a car dealership or any dealership and they start throwing paper at you and you're excited you're buying this brand new thing. You're excited about that. And you don't notice that there's this disclaimer language and it's gotten worse over the years. And in my video, I hold it up on camera and show what it looks like. And it's just blocks and blocks of bolded, underlined text that says, you promise not to sue us. You waive your right to claim for the implied warning merchantability. You claim, you know, you waive your claims for uh, warranty for fitness. And most people don't even know what most of that means. And literally, it means that if you walked in, signed all the papers, paid them for the unit, walked out and it wouldn't start, you still have to take it. And by the way, the manufacturer's on the hook. This dealership, you can't sue them for anything, even if you never drove it That's at amazing. all. That's amazing. Yeah. And now, most cases aren't that egregious. But in this case, the guy said, I got two weeks of use out of it. but it was not operating during those two weeks and the court threw the case out and, and it was upheld by a court on appeal that said that's that's how these laws work and generally speaking if you don't agree to things don't sign them because the laws presume that if you sign a document that you understood it that you agreed with it and that's why you're signing it and uh, you know i know people who just say you know i signed the document signed that you know they often throw documents at you that take you like three days to read and you've got 15 minutes till we close you know and that's a common thing I hear all the time. So this case, the consumer, the, the purchaser only used this for a couple of weeks. It spent like, as, if I recall this case, it spent like a year uh, in, uh, in for repair or back at the dealership. And it never did work for him. Right, right. And he and can't so sue them because he basically said when he bought it and signed that that purchase that he wouldn't that he, that they weren't responsible. Right. And so keep in mind how that common is that? It's very common. But there's a couple of different parties we're talking about. So you always talk about the manufacturer, which is Thor, the seller, which is Camping World, and then there's always there, there can always be other parties. Like here, I believe it had a Chrysler powertrain, drivetrain chassis underneath it. Okay. And so there's the manufacturer of that also. And so the court was saying, you can still sue the manufacturer. You can sue Thor. 
you just can't sue the seller. Because here's the thing. In Michigan in particular, there's been some great case law that says that if you're sold a product that doesn't work and it's so soon after purchase that you can revoke your acceptance of it and say, look, it's so defective. I wouldn't have taken it if I'd known it was going to be this defective. And courts have upheld that. But that's state law. And state law can be waived in some cases. And so the court here was saying that when you go into a camping world and agree that you'll never sue them, you're bound by that. So it's just, uh, you know, what's in their contract and how restrictive it is. Now, that's camping world. Are other dealers around the country, do they have similar contracts, similar, uh, similar provisions in their buying? It varies from dealer to dealer. And that's one of the things I would recommend to somebody who's shopping is consider going to a smaller dealer. They do lower volume. They're a little bit more anxious to make a sale. Each sale is more important to them. And you might be able to negotiate some of this stuff away. But I've heard of a lot of people telling me that nowadays, even the smaller dealers, the one-off mom and pop RV dealer is using this same language because they see the big guys doing it and they just borrow the language and they use it too. But, you know, you can try to negotiate it away and see what happens. So when you buy an, a new RV and you get all these documents, what should people look for? And where should they see these red flags? What advice do you give them when they see those clauses? Well, it's going to be in the purchase agreement, or it might be called a sales contract, but it's the document you sign that says, I am hereby committing to purchase this vehicle. Um, I've also seen it included on the RD-108, which is the application for title, but there's not enough room there for all the disclaimers. So it's usually a two-sided document. A lot of times they put some on the front, some on the back. I've seen it before where it says uh, language on the back is as important as that on the front. And by signing this agreement, you agree that you've read the back and understood the back. And I have people say, I never saw that language. So, you know, it's there. And, and my number one piece of advice is just for you to understand that it's there, and understand what it means. So if you can live with the fact that you can never go after the seller, go ahead and buy it and sign it. And just know that you have a manufacturer's warranty that you can work with. However, if you need to sue the manufacturer, you may have to go to Indiana to do it. And that's even if you're in New Mexico or Alaska. Now, how did that happen? This, this, this guy bought this product in the state of Virginia. Mm -hmm. He lost his ability to sue Camping World because he signed this document that he maybe didn't even understand what he was doing. But he signed it and yep. it was pretty clear what he was signing, you yep. know. So the court threw that out. But what about suing Thor? Why couldn't he sue them where he bought the vehicle? He didn't buy it in Indiana. Well, there's a forum selection clause in the warranties. And when you buy this vehicle, one of the things you sign is a, a thing that says that you've received all the warranty booklets and you agree with the warranty language. And no one's read that either. I've, I've represented people who bought RVs and they get a banker's box filled with warranty booklets. Like nobody's read that before they bought the vehicle. But in there's a forum selection clause. And most courts will enforce that as long as it's reasonable. And so I've seen people signing documents in other states that says, if I got to sue somebody, I got to sue them over here in Southfield, Michigan, or I got to sue them in Los Angeles, California. And people don't stop to think what that practical effect might be down the road. And they need to understand that, in essence, you're giving up your legal rights because you can't really enforce them. Uh, what you're going to need to do if you're in Virginia and you want to sue Thor is you need to find an attorney in Indiana who handles these cases. You might be able to find one, but of course, everybody with a bad RV is looking for those attorneys. And then again, you're also doing this on a home field advantage for somebody else. You're suing the manufacturers where they live. And so a lot of the employees, a lot of the business, all that stuff is all local. And it will spill into the courtroom that they have a home field advantage. So you've got to, they have an issue with the manufacturer. They have an mm -hmm. issue with the seller, the, the camping world. What about uh, the motor, the engine, which was, and the chassis, which were from uh, uh, still another company, in this case, Chrysler. Uh, uh, yeah. The Chrysler, yeah. And, and so they, they, Chrysler now. Yeah. So, so in the old days, I'd file a lawsuit like this and I'd sue the seller, I'd sue the manufacturer, I'd sue Chrysler. I might even sue the bank if it's financed because you may have to do the holder language and other story altogether. But you can sue Chrysler and Chrysler probably wouldn't care where you sue them. But you've got to have all this stuff in one lawsuit because it all arises from the same transaction, the same thing. So if you're going to sue the manufacturer in Indiana, you wind up having to sue Chrysler in Indiana. Now, one thing I would say is that if the primary problem was with Chrysler and the other stuff was minor, 
I might advise my client, look, if you want to, we can sue him here in Virginia. We can sue Chrysler. We just won't sue Thor. But I forgot exactly how serious the problems were with Thor versus the ones they had with the, with the drivetrain. So that may or may not help anybody. Now, there was a California case that was sort of related to the same issue that you have been reporting about. Tell us how that is, uh, fits into all of this. Well, interestingly, somebody in California filed a very similar lawsuit, and a court actually referred to Thor's language regarding you have to sue us in Indiana and said it was a scheme. That was the word the court used to deprive consumers of their rights because everyone knows they're not doing that because it makes it easier for anyone. They're doing it because it makes it harder for consumers to pursue their rights. And it turns out, especially in California, there's apparently some consumer protection laws there that say that you cannot force a consumer to sign a document that purports to waive rights that they cannot waive. And there are some statutes that say, we give you these rights by statute, but by the way, these rights cannot be waived. Otherwise, everybody would just have you sign a contract saying, I waive these rights, I waive these rights. And so, the court pointed out that by putting this language in the warranty that you've got to sue us in Indiana, a lot of people won't even consult an attorney. They'll just go, oh, I can't sue. I can't go to Indiana. And they drop it. And that's what they're hoping. So I've seen language in contracts that is actually unenforceable, but it's put there to scare people. So the language in the Camping World Purchase Agreement is going to be enforceable in most places. The UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, says specifically that you can waive some of your rights as long as it's done clearly and explicitly and so on. But with respect to waiving your consumer rights in California in particular, uh, the courts have said, no, that's not enforceable. But the real problem is that a lot of people won't even get that far because they're just going to read it and go, oh, I got no case. So bottom line, <laughs> in one of your videos, you said, don't buy a new RV. Right. <laughs> you couldn't understand why anybody would ever buy a new RV. Um, talk to those people who are not ready to go buy an RV. What, what do they do? I, well, I put up a second video because I, originally I called people insane who buy brand new RVs today. And I said, you know, it's unfair of me to call you insane without explaining to you what the sane people do. What you do if you want to buy an RV today. Let's suppose you're new to RVing and you thought I'm going to buy a new one to, to solve all my problems. No, don't do that. Don't do that. You can rent an RV and the average, the average person only uses an RV two to three weeks out of the year. Okay. That's either how much time they've got or, you know, they get sick of it, whatever. You can rent an RV for a couple of weeks, rent it for a couple of weeks, see if you enjoy it. And I've actually met people who did that and said, you know something, I got it out of my system. I, I don't want to own one. I'm happy renting one for two weeks out of the year. But if you rent one and you really like it, what I suggest you do is as you're camping, okay, go to a campground. I camp every year. Campers are some of the most friendly, outgoing people I've ever met. You walk around in the morning, people are getting up, doing their coffee. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Where are you from? You know, ask people, by the way, is this your rig? Do you like it? Do you have problems with it? Who'd you buy it from? Learn what kind of things you're looking for and then go out and buy a used one. You can get such a deal on a used one and someone else has gotten the bugs worked out of it. Or if not, I would recommend you get it inspected. So you can find RV inspectors. You have to flip them a couple hundred bucks to do this, but they'll come out, they'll climb around it, they'll spot the things and they'll say, look, here's what you're getting. Here's what work it needs, but you're getting a discount. Remember people always said about you buy a brand new car, the second it rolls off the lot, it drops in value. It's even bigger with RVs. And there's a huge market out there for used RVs and many of them are lightly used because people buy a brand new one, they use it for three weeks, they got sick of it, they want to sell it. So I would urge you to do some homework, rent one, and buy one used, or or roll the dice and hope you get lucky with a brand new one that costs a lot more. Is it worthwhile, last question, is it worthwhile for a new RV buyer to consult with an attorney before they sign those papers or get a copy of them and bring them to an attorney? Are, they, is this, are those clauses negotiable at all? You know, I don't think they are. I've never heard of anybody successfully negotiating away the, 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 the big, bold, underlined print on a purchase contract. But an attorney will probably tell you what I'm telling you right now. And that is that if you sign this document, here's what you're agreeing to. But there's a chance. Here's, and here's what I would suggest is instead of going to the big, big dealer that's got the acres and acres and acres of, of RVs just sitting there, go to a smaller mom and pop place, uh, a place with only one store, and every sale to them means a lot. 
And if you're talking to them and you say, look, dude, I, I really am interested in buying this from you. Uh, but, you know, this language here scares me. And I know this language is the camper world language. Is there any chance we can strike those paragraphs and see what they say? And if they say no, say, well, I'm going to go talk to camper world because they got cheaper prices than you. And they might be willing to negotiate. <laughs> might be. I can't guarantee anything. Steve, thank you so much. We, we would love to have you back uh, in, uh, as these issues keep coming up. And uh, hopefully we can uh, bring you the podcast. We're going to send everybody over to your YouTube channel and learn more about all of this kind of stuff and to stay uh, in tune with what, uh, what the consumers need to know before you make these kinds of purchases. Steve Absolutely. Leto, thank you for being our guest. Anytime. Thank you. Well, that was really interesting. <laughs> Steve's a good interview, and uh, I hope we can get him back on the podcast. But uh, it's not just Camping World that has that provision, as he said, that many RV dealers have it. Uh, and it's something that, you know, you just kind of, you have signature, uh, uh, signature tiredness, you know, after you get through it. Well, it's such an emotional thing to be buying such an expensive purchase and you're a little dazed, I think, and you just don't believe that somebody would ask you to sign something like that. Even though it clearly says it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, nobody can say that, hey, I mean, it's, it's many times in bold print, all in caps, it, but he, I, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, it's like sad, really. I don't know how else to describe it, that people, this thing happens to folks. You know, I think there's a lot of things that we sign out there. I, I was overwhelmed with that. Like even going to the doctor's office at the hospital, you're signing, signing, oh, signing. Yeah. And you're not reading line after line after line. Yeah. <laughs> what am I signing? And usually, you know, there's somebody across the desk from you kind of like, here, take this, sign yeah. this here, and here's two more. And, you know, there's, you'd think there'd be a better way to do it. But, hey. That's the way it works, I guess. Thanks to Steve for helping shed light on this, uh, this I think, rather insidious way of doing business. But that's the way yeah, it's Yeah, it shouldn't be like that. Not saying it's illegal. Just saying it isn't very nice. No. <laughs> I can say that, can I? All right, when we come back, uh, the RV news of the week. This is the time of year when a lot of people start shopping for their next RV. Checking out all of the 2024s online, going to shows. Keystone RV made it easy this year by putting together a guide of their favorite new models and features from all of their fifth wheel brands, Montana, Cougar, Alpine, Arcadia, and Sprinter. Each brand has different floor plans and styling, features, price points, all backed by Keystone's history of innovation, quality, and owner support. The guide is free, and you can get it at KeystoneRV.com. One of the models that was just added to the buying guide is the Montana 3623EB. Besides unparalleled fifth wheel luxury and comfort, this model has an all new e-bike stow and go storage design. The biggest challenge for RV owners is keeping those bikes safe and charged. Montana designed the strut assisted bike rack system that lets you easily load and store your bikes inside of your coach even has a power supply to keep them charged. Learn more and get your free guide at KeystoneRV.com. There is a new development coming on the market for RVers in Tennessee. It's built by the same company we bought our land from. We just went to look at it and it is amazing. Mountaintop property, great views, big woods and trails close to the Buffalo River, like our property, gorgeous countryside. It's only a few minutes from the Natchez Trace Parkway and an easy drive to Nashville. These are big properties, five acres and up, and the prices are great. There's even financing. We are really happy with our property. These guys do a great job. It's hard to find acreage where you can have an RV full time, especially in popular destination spots. This is your property, your way. There's electric and high-speed fiber optic internet. No more crowded parks or reservations. You can stay as long as you want. Go to rvlands.net. That's rvlands.net. Well, now for the news of the week. In case you haven't noticed, gas prices uh, see double-digit hike. So it's not your imagination. Gas prices are climbing nationally, and they're climbing faster than normal. AAA reports the average gas price surged ahead 12 cents per gallon last week, the steepest climb in months. 
One reason is the Pea Whiting Refinery in Indiana has been down for more than two weeks, impacting supplies, especially in the Midwest. Also, there's an unusual increase every year there's an increase as winter ends and refineries switch to summer fuel which costs a little bit more but whatever the cause this is the highest gas price at the pump in months and this is not good news for our viewers over the weekend the average price per gallon in the u.s was 328 while the average price for a gallon of diesel was 411 419 in michigan is what i'm seeing everywhere wow. around where we are in southwest michigan yeah. Uh, hey, if you uh, go to rvlifestyle.com and look at the show notes for this episode, we'll give you uh, 13 tips on how you can get, get, her mass, get better gas mileage, better fuel mileage in your RV. Uh, and you'll find that with the show notes here at rvlifestyle.com slash podcast. Well, um, there's a new National Historic Site that is uh, receiving national park recognition. It's the Amachi National Historic Site. It's officially designated a National Historic Site, which is a national park classification in the National Park Service. Located in southeastern Colorado, Amachi was one of 10 spots around the country where thousands of Japanese Americans were interned during World War II. And at its peak, more than 10,000 Americans of Japanese descent were detained at Amachi. Uh, the grounds contain a historic cemetery, a monument, barracks, their recreation hall, a guard tower, water tank. All of those have been restored. Uh, others are being reconstructed. And by being in the uh, national park system, the history and the buildings will be preserved and, and remembered. And uh, we'll put a link to more information of that also in the show notes. So the National Park Service is uh, taking public comments about proposed 50% increase in camping fees for Blue Ridge Parkway. Terrific. <laughs> the park of the the price of camping at several campgrounds in the Blue Ridge Parkway is likely to go up this year. The National Park Service is taking comments on a proposed increase, which would take effect in May. The price increases are for front and back camping, along with non-camper fees charged for showers and dumping. If it goes into effect, the nightly camping fee for eight front country campgrounds would rise from 20 a night to 30 a night, and the cost for a non-camper to shower or use the dump station would go from $3 to $6. The uh, National Park Service hasn't raised camping fees since 2016, yep. so there's going to be a lot of stinky campers out there, huh? <laughs> I think that's reasonable. I mean, nobody likes price hikes. but $6, uh, so if you're a poor kid backpacking yeah, yeah, but, or somebody you know, doesn't have any money. Uh, but somebody's got to maintain all those things. Yeah. And, they, and the National Park Service really does have to upgrade their service along right. many places. Blue Ridge Camp uh, Parkway is just a beautiful area, great camping there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can, terrific. Nobody likes the price right, but what the heck. Now, here is something that is going to make a lot of folks uh, really upset. And um, the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta is cutting the number of RV camping spots that will be available this fall. Now, the Balloon Fiesta is a major event. Um, and uh, it's always hard to get a camping spot there. They always fill up right away, and it's going to get a lot harder now uh, because the city of Albuquerque is eliminating 340 RV spots in the north parking area. The Fiesta organizers said that they're doing this because there were not enough parking spaces for cars last October, and so if they get rid of 340 RV spots, the Fiesta can add more than 2,000 new spots for car parking. Uh, the Fiesta still has something like 1,504 total RV spaces spread throughout three different parking areas. But with more than 1,000 RVers on a waiting list for this truly bucket list event, um, the news is bound to bring a lot of disappointment to the RV community. Um, and that's a sad thing to see. We really think the world of the Bloom Festival and now it's going to be harder to get a camping spot. So the first thing I think of is what do they charge an RV to park and what are they going to charge a car? But that's okay because they have to make money and more people can see with yeah. the cars. Then, you know, I guess we have to be grateful as RVers that we have spots. Yes, I guess so. Um, and, you know, I, I'm nobody likes change and... Change seems to happen all the time. Yeah, whether you like it or not. <laughs> whether you like it or not. All right, when we come back, RV questions of the week. Stay with us.
we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborne batteries. Battleborne batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And Battleborne batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have, and they'll probably be the same on your rig too. Battleborne battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborne batteries, they allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back. Time now for the RV questions of the week. We have three of them for you this week. We're going to take uh, kind of clear out our mailbox a little bit. Uh, so we want to remind you, by the way, before we get started, that we love your questions. We love your comments. And you can reach us through our private email, which is Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com. All right. What's our first question? Okay. Our first question is, have you ever had a pet boarding place require proof that your pet was uh, vaccinated against the flu? It just happened to us, Betsy. Um, well, y yes, yes, we have. Mm -hmm. uh, many dog daycare centers and boarding kennels, we've encountered them repeatedly, uh, do require this. We've gotten Bo vaccinated for the flu. I noticed that it seemed to be something that was mostly in the, the south. south. Yeah. yeah. We never heard of that in the north. Uh, but in the south, we did that you had to have flu vaccinations. Now, you're supposed to also get boosters. Uh, Bo has not been boosted for the flu, but we have since heard, somebody posted on our RE Lifestyle community, that uh, there may be a shortage of the canine flu vaccine. Uh, and so uh, this one person, uh, Patricia, wrote that her vet has said it's uh, in short supply. And so uh, she hadn't boosted her dog. But um, she, if you have the proof that your dog was, was at least given the initial inoculation, that should be enough. Uh, many kennels know that, that there's a shortage and are making allowance if he was previously um, fully vaccinated. I know. When we first heard that uh, to board a bow in a daycare that he had to have a flu vaccine, I thought, what? That was years ago. And now I accept it. It seems like there are so many different diseases out there. We want to protect our fur babies. Yes. And any way that we can. But when I first heard it, I was like, no way. Yeah. You gotta be kidding me. But but yes, it does it does happen and and, uh, and and quite frequently in the South and in the West particularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now for question number two. We have a small Arcadia fifth wheel. If we stop for the night and stay hooked up, can we put out the slides? If we are a touch nose high on the RV and not totally level when driving multiple days to reach a destination, it's a bit crazy having to unhook every night and, and then undo it all in the morning. Yeah. And that question comes from Mark. 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 Um, yes, it does. And um, Mark, uh, it should be fine to do that. We have done it ourselves. Many people do it uh, as long as you're not way crazy uh, out of level. Uh, it's fine and you're only doing this for a short period of time um you shouldn't have any problem at all so don't worry about it it is a hassle that is one of the things about towing a fifth wheel is you know it's uh, setting up and taking off is a little more involved than it is with the motor home uh, but um unfortunately you know, but you get all that extra unfortunately room. the princess and the p i can't sleep if it's not flat yeah. <laughs> well you, now, you, now you have done that before and it's fine even though we're it's, it's pretty much flat you haven't really noticed it because the nose if it's nose high a little bit you run into me and i don't, <laughs> I don't complain <laughs> but uh go right for it unless you can't sleep then then you're gonna have to have to level it that uh yeah you can sleep standing up just about after, right yeah, yeah okay question number three we've been followers for several years and have listened to you as you've uh, shared all your travels have you ever had a class a if not why not that's what we want to get next we're currently in a class c and this is from grant uh, no, we have uh, never had a class uh, class A. We've done a lot of other things. Yeah, we've had tent camping, pop-up camper, 
a, a trailer that we pulled a B, C, fifth wheel, but there's two things we haven't had. A class A. A class A and a truck camper. Now, a class A is on our bucket list to try. We we really do think we, because, you know, we get questions from people with a class A and I hate to say, no, we've never had one. Mm -hmm. So I do think we need to at least try out uh, a couple of them to camp in them and see how they work. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll like them too, but we have not tried one before. And um, the reason why, to be really candid, is we thought they were too, too big. Too big. <laughs> but as we've gotten used to towing our fifth wheels, size doesn't quite intimidate us like it, it did before. So we're ready to try a Class A so we can tell you what we think of that. I think you're ready, boy. I am ready. I'd love to give it a try. I like looking at some of those smaller Class A's. Mm -hmm. I think those have a great, they're very popular. And I noticed yeah. a lot of them at the Tampa show. And then We've never been in a big class A, and I'd like to see what that is like, too. Yeah. Uh, but there's one other one we haven't ever tried. The truck camper. We've never had a truck camper. So we suppose that should go on our list as well. Sure. Things we need our to Our wish try. list. Yeah. Uh, so um, looks like we can stay busy for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is good with us. We love getting out there. All right. Three questions this week. How's that? You got some? You can send them to us, Mike and Jen, at rvlifestyle.com. Again, we hit the road uh, this week. So next week, we'll be somewhere, Lord willing, south of here, hopefully in a little warmer weather. And uh, we look forward to being with you. And we want to remind you, if you're watching this on Wednesday, the 21st of February, make sure you come to our RV Lifestyle community Thursday, the 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll announce all the details of our spring and uh, summer uh, gathering that we'll be doing in June. So details on that and uh, we'll share some more about that next week in the podcast as well thank you guys so much for watching happy trails